Hello and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation Wellness Wednesday webinar. I'm Annie Brooks, subbing in for our usual host, Krista Ellis. Helping me behind the scenes are my colleagues, Jenny Fierde and Laura Cameron. The Parkinson's Foundation is a nonprofit focused on bettering the lives of those living with Parkinson's by improving care and advancing research. Most importantly, Everything we do is in close concert with our community to ensure that our actions are aligned with the needs and priorities of those living with Parkinson's. Making the decision to come out with Parkinson's can be an emotional and personal one. Today, we will be hearing from your peers who have navigated this process and the lessons they have learned along the way. We are recording today's presentation. We're also streaming live on Facebook. So welcome if you're joining us uh, from Facebook. Those of you who are on the Zoom webinar will receive a follow-up email with the link to today's recording and other resources in the coming days. If you are with us on Facebook, um, feel free to reach out to our helpline to get connected uh, and get those resources as well. The Parkinson's Foundation provides weekly education and wellness programs virtually through our PD Health at Home series, including Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, and Fitness Fridays, expert briefings, and our Spanish language programming, EP Salud en Casa. Join us for our next Wellness Wednesday on November 1st, Art Moves Me, Exercising Body and Mind. Our social engagement series welcomes members of the Parkinson's community to come together to enjoy art, music, literature, and more, as well as an opportunity to meet and socialize with others. Find out more and register for our PD Health at Home events at www.parkinson.org slash pdhealth. This Friday, we're hosting our live Fitness Fridays. I would like to invite you to join us in movement. On Friday, our instructors from Parkinson's Partners of Northwest Pennsylvania will focus on total body functional exercises that incorporate aerobic activity, strength, agility, and balance. The instructors will offer modifications that allow you to choose to increase or decrease the challenge. Sign up to attend the live stream at parkinson.org slash pdhealth. To follow this event, we will be hosting a Parkinson's Anonymous for those who are keeping their loved ones secret. Help us spread the word and share about our Parkinson's Anonymous Keeping Their Secret webinar on November 15th. You can share this with your community, with support groups, with exercise classes, or if you are one of the anonymous with your loved ones who do know about your Parkinson's, share this with anyone you feel could make it could make an impact on. And you can learn more by finding this event on our webpage at parkinson.org slash pdhealth. Before we kick off and hear from our panelists, we are first going to hear from Kelly McWilliams, who is going to talk to us about the importance of taking the time you need to process a diagnosis and the ways that you can help yourself move from that initial processing phase into a place where you feel you are ready to move forward with Parkinson's disease. Following Kelly's opening, we will hear from three peers who've had different experiences in how their Parkinson's diagnoses impacted their work, family, and self-identity. Kelly, thank you so much for getting us started today. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Uh, bear with me one moment, I'm going to share my slides. One second. 
Okay, hopefully everybody can see my slides only. Um, so welcome everybody. My name is Kelly McWilliams. I'm a nurse supporting Parkinson's care. I work at Corwell Health, which is located in Grand Rapids, Michigan, if you happen to know where that is. Uh, thank you for joining today's discussion called Parkinson's Anonymous. Today we will talk about how and when to share Parkinson's diagnosis with others. Whether you are newly diagnosed or have been living with Parkinson's for some time, the decision of when to share is a personal one. This topic is important because it is something that anyone diagnosed with Parkinson's will face at some point in time. But it is also something in the clinical setting that could be easily overlooked as a point of discussion. Clinicians are understandably very busy talking about symptoms and treatments. So pausing that discussion to have candid conversation about if people are sharing the diagnosis with others and how they are managing that can often be just overlooked incidentally. So that's what makes today's discussion so important. So as you know, Parkinson's is a life-changing diagnosis. I have the privilege to work as a nurse and support many individuals living with Parkinson's. I work um, in nurse education, so I meet with individuals newly diagnosed and I help provide not only education and resources, but also emotional support early on. Additionally, I work with people who've been living with disease for many years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years and with advanced Parkinson's. So I span a range um, of people on their journeys with disease. With the privileges I've had of working with all of these people, I have learned through their experiences and people have shared a variety of thoughts and emotions that they went through when they first received their diagnosis. People report, report feeling disbelief, sadness, despair, so such down despair that they maybe don't feel they can go on. Anger, fear, so many fears people have shared about the future or worried about what people may think of them or judge them or perhaps reject them. And along with that comes worry. On the flip side, many people also share some positive thoughts and feelings. People report feeling relieved with the diagnosis in many cases People have had symptoms for years and they weren't quite sure what those symptoms were and having a label and knowing that it's Parkinson's helped give some relief that they knew how to move forward. Or some people, their worries were worse than what Parkinson's could be. So having Parkinson's was a relief in that regard. Many people also share with me that they are hopeful, optimistic, curious, and resolved to move forward with their diagnosis. So as you can see, there's no one size fits all. Um, you may relate to many of these descriptions with your own thoughts and emotions, or even all of them. And please give yourself grace with whatever you are feeling and experiencing because it is normal. Everyone would feel the same mix of emotions if they were in your shoes. And just know you're not alone with that and give yourself grace as you process those um, thoughts and emotions. With a diagnosis, of course, in my role, I am faced with many questions. How did I get Parkinson's? What are the symptoms? What can I expect? How can I fight this disease? So again, in the clinical setting, we focus so much time on answering these very important questions. So I'm so grateful to have you here today where we're talking pointedly about sharing a diagnosis with others amid all of these other questions you have. So when people ask me about sharing a diagnosis, the very first thing I say is it is a personal decision. I encourage people to take the time they need first with their diagnosis. So they are best prepared to share with others and respond to the reactions that others may have. So I'm using a framework here for who, what, when, why, and how. Perhaps this is a tool that's helpful for you. Consider who you think you should tell, who you've thought should know. Maybe you haven't told them yet. 
Maybe only your spouse knows or nobody else knows, but consider your list of people. You, may, you might even consider writing an actual list. Who are those people that are closest to you or maybe further removed? That can help you prioritize on your own list all of the people at some point in time you might consider sharing with. Your list will differ from someone else, um, but consider a spouse, a partner, your household members, children. Those are special circumstances. There are younger children, which are very different from teenagers, which are different from adult children. And each of those groups will have an, a unique approach to how you may share with those um, different age groups. Even parents, elderly parents, for example, we all have parents and hopefully if many of you have living parents, you know, we treat that as a unique circumstance because parents are very sensitive about their children. So there's no perfect way to tell any of these individuals, but first consider who, who you think should know about your diagnosis or who do you wish you could tell, even if it's hard, who's on that list. Consider what you want to say. Planning ahead could be very helpful. So think about what do you want to share and what do you not want to share at this time? That will give you a little more control over the conversation. So you will likely have different conversations with the different people that you want to share with. You might even wanna write down or type or dictate just a few thoughts so you can consider Again, what you intentionally want to clearly and simply share with these people and maybe things you don't really want to touch on. So you're prepared to um, change the conversation in a different direction if certain topics are off limits for you and you don't want to go there just yet. Consider when there's no perfect time to share with people and there's no defined timeline but consider the benefits of sharing your diagnosis with those closest to you early. For one, it's most helpful to get support. Not everybody's lives are the same. Not everybody's in a happy marriage, for example, but if you have loved ones and you have people um, living with you and that you consider close to you, engaging them early will offer you support early. And then those people can work with you in deciding on when to share with others and how. Consider asking yourself why you're sharing with each of these people. Not that you should not share with them, but asking the critical question why will help you figure out the pros and cons of sharing with each person so that you're best prepared when you address each individual um, on your list. And very importantly, how? How do you plan to tell individuals? People may um, want to have one-to-one -one conversations that are more intimate and personal and planned uh, versus some people would like to have all three of their children in the room together when they talk about it as a family and have their spouse there with them. So again, there's not one single approach. It depends on the individual and the family and your unique circumstances. So consider how, how you would like to approach each person. Um, if one-to-one -one conversation um, is not best suited for you and you prefer a phone call, you have that control to do that based on the person on, on your list. Some people even will write a letter that they find they can explain themselves better in writing and that it reduces some initial emotional response. So sharing a letter where the person can receive it, read it, process, and then follow up with conversation is an avenue that some people have shared that has worked well for them. So please take some time to process your thoughts, your feelings, and emotions with the diagnosis. Whether you're newly diagnosed or you have been living with Parkinson's for several years, there's no defined timeline. It's a process and please give yourself grace in the process of what you are managing. Understand what this means for you before you decide you want to share with others, perhaps. Learn, 
engage with learning. You know, knowledge is power. We've heard that before. The more you understand about Parkinson's, the better you can explain your diagnosis to others. And people out there might have a lot of misunderstandings about Parkinson's. Some people might not know at all what it is. They might think it's fatal. They might think that it causes just shaking and nothing else. Or they might just think it's an old person's disease. And we all know these are all myths. So we have to make sure we understand a foundation about Parkinson's so that when people say things that might not be true, you are in a good position to give them some facts. And those facts often can help reduce a lot of the heightened emotions that come with sharing a diagnosis. And lastly, um, reflect. There are many impacts with sharing a diagnosis with others. Consider health when you're holding something in and you're keeping it inside. Certainly there is stress and anxiety that comes along with that. And when that happens, sleep can be impaired, mood can be impaired, people can be more irritable or isolate more. So consider being open about your diagnosis as a means of combating some of these negative health consequences. Consider those relationships in your life. Uh, we know that Parkinson's creates what's called a ripple effect. So it's not just the individual diagnosed, but it's all those people around you in your household and, and even acquaintances. So being open about your feelings and your symptoms and concerns really can help strengthen some relationships and it gives you the support that you may need and, and want with your Parkinson's. Um, lastly, reflect on the concept of support. Support can be physical, emotional, spiritual, and even practical but how can you receive help and support if others do not know what you're dealing with? If you share your diagnosis with others, others most likely will want to help you. And when you share your diagnosis with others, it helps people understand perhaps why you're being irritable or why you're, being, why you're anxious or why you're isolating. It helps to explain some behaviors or perhaps symptoms that they're observing in you. So that gives them the opportunity to support you through some of these difficulties and even nurture your relationship uh, by having more intimacy and more meaningful dialogue. So I'm going to end with just highlighting a few resources. I really value everything our, our patients tell us and um, there's nothing um, more valuable than hearing from people living in your shoes, people who have, um, been diagnosed with Parkinson's, have faced the same uh, questions about sharing are the best resource. Um, I encourage you to, you know, you're at a webinar like today, it's an excellent step from hearing from others. Um, utilize the PD conversations on the Parkinson Foundation website or the Parkinson's Buddy Network on the Michael J. Fox website. These are ways you can talk to people online living with Parkinson's and hear about their stories. Um, the Davis Finney Foundation has Parkinson's ambassadors that you can talk to as well. Support groups are another avenue books and webinars like today. So uh, when you hear from others who have a shared experience, it certainly can help guide you in taking difficult step and, and know that they have done it successfully and so can you. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Annie and thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much, Kelly. I think we have heard a lot of great strategies. I think we've heard um, why this can be so challenging, but I'm really excited to spend some time hearing the lived experience of uh, what I consider the true experts, people living with Parkinson's. We are going to start with an interview with Elva, who is going to share how difficult it was even just to say that she had Parkinson's, keeping her diagnosis a secret from a lot of her family for four years.
Could you share about the time leading up to your diagnosis? What, what was going on? What was it like to receive your diagnosis? Um, it took two years for me to get my diagnosis. I saw doctor after doctor, copay after copay. Um, I had to take so much time off from work. I knew something was wrong with my body, but I didn't know what. And it became a process of elimination. It wasn't this and it wasn't that. But I wanted to know what it was because I knew it was something. My body wasn't functioning like it used to. And um, I finally got approval to see a neurologist. I met with him for two hours with my husband. And he said, uh, when he gave me my diagnosis of early onset Parkinson's at the age of 49, he said that the first five minutes that he met me, he knew I had Parkinson's. I said, why did you wait so long? Why did we, why were we here two hours? He said he wanted to see um, me react to certain things and uh, answer questions and and just be certain. Um, when he told me my diagnosis, I was really, really happy. I was ecstatic and he's never had anybody be happy about a Parkinson's diagnosis. I wasn't happy that it was Parkinson's, but I was happy that I had a diagnosis. Although once you got your diagnosis, you know, you felt this relief. You had an answer to why you were feeling the way you did, what was going on with your body. And yet it, you weren't able to, you felt that you couldn't share this with a lot of people in your life. Why? What was the hesitation to share with your loved ones? I think the best thing, the best answer I can give you is I couldn't say the words. I couldn't even mouth it. And I had Parkinson's. It was hard to, to take in. Um, I didn't want to have a disease. I've been healthy my whole life. My whole family's been healthy. And uh, now I had to take medication and do more things to take care of myself. And I was, uh, there was a, a lot of unknown things to deal with. Um, I, I just couldn't say it. Thinking, thinking about, you know, this diagnosis, you've, you've made the decision not to share with your family, your loved ones. Can you share a little bit about the things that might have changed in your life, say, how it affected your work or the way that you felt uh, in relation with your husband, how these sorts of things kind of changed as you started to navigate and learn about Parkinson's? Surely, um, at work, it was very difficult because uh, I couldn't type like I used to type. I couldn't write. Um, I had to make a lot of phone calls, and even this dialing was difficult. I used my calculator for numbers when I had to write down numbers because it was a tanky instead of using my computer. I used a lot of tricks to uh, get by with my work. I think I was also afraid of losing my job. Um, you know, I was 49, and who was going to hire me? Uh, at this age, if I lost my job, uh, my husband he was very supportive. He went to every doctor appointment I had all those two years until I got my diagnosis, and he um, he said we'll get through it. Um, he was very very supportive, and I think he's the one who helped me the most. Uh, my doctor certainly helped me, but my husband was uh, the rock. And I, I, I told him that I didn't want to be a burden to him, which I thought I was going to be. But um, he's never treated me that way. You know, you mentioned being a professional and you were working, you were um, providing income for your household. And, mm -hmm. you know, especially in Western culture, our professions are a way that we identify ourselves and these simple things like typing and writing or even, you know, feeding ourselves, putting a fork yes. to our mouth. Can you share uh, how the, those abilities changed with your diagnosis, how they made you feel? It was difficult because um, before my diagnosis, I didn't know what was wrong. But then when I had my diagnosis and I read, and I, I felt saw the correlation of the symptoms. It made sense. Uh, it made sense, but it didn't, uh, how do I say, it didn't uh, register to me, but then my hands wouldn't move, you know? 
I couldn't do things with my hands and you feel, uh, I felt less of a person. I know that sounds strange, but when you can't brush your teeth, bathe, wash your hair, or you can't wash your hair, you know, that's, you need to do those basic things and I couldn't do those basic things anymore. It took me so long to do any kind of um, anything for myself. Um, I learned a lot of tricks, especially at work. Um, I used to train people who were coming in, so I would be on the computer and then they would sit next to me and I would show them the ropes of the computer and our processes. And uh, I said, well, I can't type. But I can certainly, certainly uh, show them how to do it. So I told them that they're going to be the driver. So I set them at the computer and uh, I, I explained to them the situation and I just reversed the process, you know. I remember we had a cafeteria at work and um, we had a steak on a Wednesday and we had steaks at work for lunch. I said, oh my God, I want a steak. So I bought myself a steak. That was my great friend who knew about the Parkinson's. And then I sat there and I cried. He goes, what's wrong? And I said, I can't cut my steak. I can't cut it. And I wanted it. And um, she just so slowly moved the place around, hers to mine, spotted mine to her spot. She cut my steak, sent it back to me, and I ate my steak. Um, it, it was hard to take that um, somebody had to do things for you like that. But when it's a good friend, it, it doesn't make it easier. And you're appreciative that they want to help you. You just don't like the fact that you have to be helped. Um, the, yeah. people who know, the five people who knew my life that I had Parkinson's was my, my dear aunt of mine, my husband, my doctor, my two best girlfriends. And uh, they helped me so much through it. I can't even repay them. Yeah, it's it's a it's a big pill to swallow when our identities are shifting and transitioning, right? When you are in a position of needing a little more support, like someone cutting your steak or helping you wash your hair, or pull your hair back. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a huge step of of bravery. So I really applaud you for for how brave you are. I never heard that before. Thank you. It's very kind of you. When you kept your diagnosis to yourself that time, yourself and the few the few core friends, those those true friends that you really felt safe with sharing this info with, how did you find support? Or who or, or what supported you during this time? When I was doing research about Parkinson's, I didn't know they had support groups. I just didn't know. My doctor had give me some some um, numbers to call and I called and I, I joined a support group and uh, it was amazing. These people I met instantly we became friends and instantly we had a connection because we had something in common, very much in common, even though we had different um, symptoms. That was the uh, first time that since being diagnosed that I felt normal. I, I didn't even feel normal, but with these people, I regained my feelings back about myself as a person, as a, a wife, and uh, even a member of society. They, um, we all shared things that were very personal, and uh, that helped me so much, and I wish I had found them so much sooner. But I didn't. It just it happened the way it happened for me. Yeah, Alva, you mentioned that y your doctor suggested or gave you these lists of support groups to reach out to. Can you share a little bit more about your relationship that that support you received from your doctor? Sure. My doctor was the director of the of the facility where I went. He was an older man, and uh, he loved to talk. I love to talk. And I love to listen. And uh, I said the first meeting we had with him was two hours. And um, he was very knowledgeable. 
he told me a lot of things that he was doing in research and uh, progression since they were having any medication and that that would be fine, that I might have hard days, bad days, but I would be fine. He reassured me, as a matter of fact, and um, I believed him and I trusted him. He had since retired before I um, I told my family, but I had, they had another doctor come in, and I went to him, and he was a lot younger than me. And then, oh my gosh, how did this young guy here help me? He's helped me so much since, and he's a, he's a part of my life. He's not just my doctor. He's a, a gentleman. He's caring. And he cares about all his patients, and you feel it. And um, I've been blessed to have great doctors. Um, my doctor left his um, practice to another, moved to another practice, and uh, I decided to move with him because he was that great. Uh, he's amazing. I Are love you sure, my doctor. You know, he 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 initially this this older doctor he gave you this diagnosis and and then you know you were kind of courted into um the care of this other doctor who provided you with these support visits these support groups to reach out to but you you elva took that step you made I, the phone calls and you went to the groups i had to you know it was um i had to take care of myself before i can help anybody else or or, uh, or feel okay about myself. Um, I've always been independent, you know, and even since I got married, I still had a lot of independence within myself. Um, and I was caring for another another human being in my family, my husband and his children. And uh, I had a responsibility. And I didn't want to miss out on anything. And that's just, just because I didn't want to miss out, but I didn't want Parsons to stop me from doing anything. I wanted to do everything I did before. It took me a while to do a lot of things, but I got stronger. I got more knowledgeable. I got stronger in my body and in my heart. And uh, here I am. And it sounds like being out in the community and uh, just involved and engaged really ignited this wanting to tell your truth to your family yeah. and friends and it's also saying there's so so much power in speaking it out loud too yeah honestly i wish i had told him sooner because uh we're a close-knit family and they were, i know they would have been there for me um it was a lonely time those four years i even asked my husband why, why did i do that do you know why you did that and he says i don't because you just i just went with what you felt and he supported me which was great and uh but that's a point if i joined helped me tremendously elva what would you say to someone who hasn't shared their diagnosis with a loved one or a family member i would uh ask someone why, why they want to choose to not tell them and listen to their reasons and i would like i said tell them my story and tell them that i wish i had done it sooner because i would have had so much more help and so much more uh my, my independence back felt better about myself and uh we were able to help more people in the meantime afterwards you know and i now um do a lot of fundraising for parkinson's awareness and my team has bought a lot of money into the parkinson's foundation and uh, i'm very proud of that and i wish i did it sooner because i would have made some more money for them <laughs> Um, it's important to me to let people know, and I'll let anybody know now, I'll shout it out to anybody, that I indeed have Parkinson's. I just love hearing these stories and hearing the growth that people experience along their Parkinson's journey. Next, we are going to hear from Anna who shares what she wished she had known when she chose to keep her diagnosis from her daughters and the lessons learned in navigating living with Parkinson's in a, a high achieving, high stress workplace. 
Anna, thank you so much for showing up today to share your story. If you would share with our community a little bit about yourself and your diagnosis before we jump into the hard questions. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Anna. Um, I was diagnosed about 16, 17 years ago now. I was 38 at the time, and I'm now 54. I was working full time, and I uh, continued to work full time for 10 years into that and chose not to really disclose my condition for quite some time. I was a, I was a leader of a sales team, uh, a, a business to business sales team, Fortune 200 company. Um, and, you know, at my, uh, I guess, highest level, I, I was a division vice president and I had from like, I had the whole Southeast coast uh, and, and into um, that, that area. So I had about a hundred people working under me. I was the youngest and only female on my leadership team at the time. So back then, you know, that was, that, that was a big deal. And I just felt like I had so many boxes around me already, and I didn't feel like having another one on me. So I just chose not, I was worried about lots of things, of course, as you might think of, uh, when it comes to announcing that you have a degenerative disease for which there is no cure. <laughs> so I chose to keep it, uh, you know, to myself for probably longer than I should have looking back on it, but yeah. It's very um, exciting to hear about the work that you've achieved and accomplished in your lifetime. And while also navigating and managing a family. Yeah, and, and a disease. <laughs> so it was, it was, I mean, my husband's awesome and he's a high school teacher. So for that period of time, I was the one who was out and about more so than he was from a work perspective. And he was more than happy to, you know, take on the roles that of the other side of the thing at the house. Um, so that's been kind of a weird transition over time as it as my disease has progressed and I'm not working now. Yeah, it sounds like you were you and your husband were able to find a new dynamic of, you know, roles shifting, who's doing what, when and where. Can you talk a little bit more about um, perhaps sharing your diagnosis with your family and maybe specifically with your with your girls? Yeah, sure. Uh, that's probably the biggest, um, I guess, dramatic part of my experience with PD so far, because my girls were nine and seven when I was when when I was diagnosed, and I truly didn't think that at the time that a nine and seven year old should a be burdened with the news or b be able to understand the complexity of the disease. So I didn't want to. I wanted them to just have their carefree childhood, like every child has, like most child children have, not everyone. And, uh, you know, uh, telling them about Parkinson's at that time just didn't seem like the right thing to do. But, um, you know, unfortunately, when you don't tell, it's it's very easy to continue to not tell because, you know, it, there's never a good time to tell, right? And especially to your kids, you don't want to lay that on them. So I didn't tell and I didn't tell. And I, I think, as I said, they were nine and seven. It was probably when they were like 12 and 14 that, uh, I finally talked to them about it. And lo and behold, I found out that my youngest daughter, who's very precocious, uh, had already found, she already sensed that and saw some of my symptoms at that point and had gone through my medicine cabinet, had found my meds and had Googled them all. And she diagnosed me herself, Dr. Google diagnosed me with Huntington's disease, which is fatal. So uh, that really caused, a, you know, when I came clean and I talked to her about what I did have, she obviously there was a lot of uh, you know hurt and uh, upsetness and you know um what's uh she was very um i think the trust was broken you know that i that i let her essentially walk around thinking that i was terminally ill for a certain period of time and rather than let her know and her in her mind you know obviously and, and it is uh parkinson's is a much less it's a it's a uh what should we say it, on the scale of, uh, of of bad things happening to you, it's it's lower on the scale of certainly than Huntington's disease. So um, it probably took us, you know, that was when she was about 12. And I would say it probably took us about six years till we really got back on solid footing fully, you know, with regards to trust and whatnot. So that was certainly not the intention of my of my, you know, lack of disclosure to them from the beginning. And that was that 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 really hit hard. And it, it took a took a toll for sure. What I'm hearing, Anna, is you kept this secret with the intention of protecting mm -hmm. your girls. 
in the end, it really hurt your relationship. Yeah. Um, your youngest one. I share that, you know, for the others watching that uh, are you know, really aren't sharing much right now, as as a, as just a you know, there's consequences to every decision you make, right? So you know that that was that was mine. That was mine. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about the dynamic that you experienced when you did choose to share with your colleagues with your workplace? Well, it's really interesting. I mean, I waited to the very end. I had um, I had already had my plans in place at that point to exit and to go out on disability. Um, worked it all out with HR, and and it was at that point that I, you know, I I I, I did so by sending a start, starting by sending an email out. Uh, because I wanted to kind of give everyone the opportunity to absorb what they were reading and understand it and not feel uncomfortable with me standing there telling them about it. Um, and there were a lot of people to tell as well. So that was one way to do it at the same time. When you disclose it, um, I think you feel much more supported than you think you would, um, at least on the surface, right? And and I still, especially with work, I can't say that I regret any any way that I that I that I that I handled things because yes, there's ADA and yes, you know, we we want to think and hope that things will go that way. But being in the position that I was in, um, I I couldn't risk it. So you know, I I earned several promotions during that time frame that I don't know if I would have gotten if I had been labeled you know with PD. So um, that's that's a tough one. That's a real tough one because certainly when it when it was disclosed and they all knew something was up too because. By that time, I definitely had symptoms. I guess it's silly to think this way, but like in my mind, I was better. I was better off having them wonder than having them know. Which is so, Anna. In our previous conversations, we you shared this this really touching story that I think is extremely relatable to our community. Would you share with us here about that leadership meeting? Sure. Yeah. So uh, this was probably my my toughest professional episode uh, dealing with Parkinson's. Um, we had a, a leadership meeting not too far from where I live. So I drove to it. Uh, most of the other guys on the team, they all flew in. And it was a tough meeting. I was, it was, I was tired and, you know, as those, those meetings always are demanding and, you know, tend to be long days, long nights. And uh, it was the last day and I was just exhausted. So as you might imagine, my, my symptoms weren't that, were, were definitely, you know, present. So I, uh, I, I go, towards the end of the meeting, I, I went to the ladies' room. And the one benefit of not having a lot of women on your sales team, on your leadership team that you're on, is that you don't have to wait to go to the bathroom, which is cool. But uh, in this case, I was in the bathroom by myself in the stall, and uh, I could hear all the guys out in the lobby, right where the you know the door to the uh, restroom opened up into, and they were all getting their bags together and waiting for their cars to go to the airport, and. Uh, I was sitting in there, shake, you know, having symptoms and feeling really exhausted and knowing that if I went out in that group at that moment, I would not show well. So I decided I was just going to sit there and wait until things in the lobby calmed down. And I waited and I waited and it took about 45 minutes till it sounded like everyone was out. And sitting in that stall for 45 minutes, thinking about what my life had turned into was definitely not fun and was pretty scary. So. Uh, you know, as those things continued to add up, I realized, you know, that it was probably time to start thinking about making a transition. Um, the other things that would happen would be things like when I was out with my sales reps on meetings, for whatever reason, as some of you on the on the call probably can relate, uh, walking through doors and elevators are really difficult at times when we're having symptoms. And so it would be quite awkward, at, you know, if the, we were finished or going to a presentation and we were getting into an elevator with you know, we usually had a few people on the team going and everybody's in the elevator and I'm still standing there <laughs> trying to get moving. So, you know, the, come on, come on, hurry up, you know. So uh, that was the, things like that started happening and it just got to be, you know, evident that I needed to consider making a change. And I know that many of us here have likely experienced some situation like that where things won't calm down externally and things aren't calming down internally. Right. Yeah. You know, I think all of that decision making and, and hot and, and cloaking of things certainly brings a stress on the body that, you know, you don't really realize, I don't think, until you tell people and until you take yourself out of the situation. You know, a lot of times, um, at least for me, that's how it was. So, you know, when I first 
start of my disability period, I, I really just vegged out for a couple of months because I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that that was done and I was, you know, exhausted from keeping it up, you know? Yeah, your nervous system was catching up. Yeah, absolutely. Anna, if you would share a little bit about YOPN, tell us what sure. YOPN is. Great. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes. Um, it didn't take long for me to uh, realize that I needed to continue to have a purpose after I left my career. And, uh, you know, I and, and, and you probably aren't surprised to hear that I had a hard time myself finding resources relevant to what I to what I was experiencing as a young onset person. Um, so I wanted I never had met anyone else that was young. I never had found resources that depicted other people that were young. It, you know, this is like the old man's disease is what everybody thinks of it as. And so I wasn't a man in that. I wasn't old. <laughs> so nothing really resounded to me, so resonated to me rather. So, um, yeah, so I took I, I, I started looking into what could I do to help change that for the next crop of folks that have to go through this thing. And uh, I, I through through um, some from some fortunate connections and through some you know, creative fundraising and things that I worked on, too. Uh, we were able to start up Young Onset Parkinson's Network, and uh, we are 501c3 now. Um, we are a group of folks that uh, are either afflicted with Young Onset, have had a diagnosis of Young Onset, or are care partners or part of the care partner team of a Young Onset. And we've grown rapidly, and I think it's a testament to the fact that there really isn't much out there for us. So, um, you know, we're glad about, we just have surpassed 800 members yesterday. So. That's exciting. We're in uh, 20, we're in 46 states and 24 countries, which is crazy. And we meet twice a month. So it's great. We bring in speakers education. We have community gatherings where people just chat in rooms and small Zoom rooms. Um, and it, it's amazing the, 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 the benefit of having a community to come together like that, which I know the Parkinson's Foundation does a lot of work to, to do that as well, to bring people together. And I've been a, a, a very grateful recipient of some community grants to help get my system, my, my organization going from you all. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's 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 been it's something that I think has really helped me. I mean, everybody that I talk to that's a member for, and whatnot are like, thank you so much for doing this. And I'm like, honestly, I'm kind of selfish because I'm doing as much for me as I am for you. Right. So uh, it keeps me in that role of kind of running an organization and leading a group and um, you know, I really, I really think that's important to my wellness, for sure. Just as important as the physical things I do for it. Yeah, I know the the Parkinson's Foundation. Speaking on behalf of the organization, we are we are so proud to support the work that you're doing with the Young Onset Parkinson's Network, Anna. So congratulations to the successes that you've had in growing the network, connecting the community. Um, yeah. Such a vulnerable time and their lives and, and really trying to put a positive spin on it because not everything is negative about this disease i mean yeah what i'm not one of those people that would say i'm happy i got it <laughs> i won't get to that far or that you know i'm glad i got it but you know if i have it it's you, you know everybody's got i'm learning as i get older too every day uh, you know i said i'm 54 now everybody's got something <laughs> it seems and this is what i've what i've been given so it could be worse. There's, uh, you can always find people that are worse than yourself. And I think your attitude and staying connected, like you said, and having a purpose are all really, really important parts to doing well with this disease long term. Such wise words. Um, we'll dig right into our final interview now, which is with JM, who shares uh, how Parkinson's killed his career, but saved his life. Um, I think uh, this will be a great way to uh, to close before we hear from our uh, participant or from um, our panelists. JM, thank you so much for joining us today. It really means a lot to me, and I know to our entire Parkinson's community to hear about your story and your perspective of living with Parkinson's. Would you share with our community today, you know, perhaps where you're located and when you were diagnosed with Parkinson's? I was, uh, I was very close to my birthday, December of, of uh, 2012. I was 46 years old and I was living in Los Angeles, California. I still am. I, well, I live in Pasadena now. What were your early signs of Parkinson's, JM? 
Well, I had to look back on it because I, there was a tremendous amount of, of lethargy and um, apathy going on. You know, I would work, I worked in the entertainment industry. I worked for 60 hours a week minimum, you know, and really like put everything I had into this career. Um, and, you know, sometimes put it ahead of my family. So I would come home and my wife would want to engage me and my young daughters who were very, very little at that time um, would want to, you know, do, you know, and I maybe half an hour, 20 minutes. And then I just wanted to sit on the couch and just stare at the tube and just do nothing but that. And I, my wife just kept saying to me, why, why are you, are you not engaging? Why are you just like so kind of lethargic? And I said, well, I just don't feel good. I mean, I just, I, I can't tell you what it is, but I just don't feel good. It's like, uh, you know, it's just like my body, I, my brain's saying, let's go do this, but my body's going, no way. And then it took like, uh, you know, it started to get a little bit more, con you know, uh, contentious between the two of us. And we started to have some arguments about it. And, and she would, you know, she would, she'd love to go out and garden and she'd go in the backyard and garden. And she'd say to me, why don't you come out here and talk to me? And I mean, you think about this, it's like your, your best friend, your wife just wants to talk to you while she's doing something. You don't have to garden. I could have sat in a lawn chair and drank a beer, but I just wanted to vegetate in front of the TV. And I said, you know, no, you know, and then one day she just said, you're being lazy. And I said, you know what? There's going to be a day that they find out that there's something wrong with me and, and you're going to rue the day. Cause I was angry and I was mad and I wish I could take that back, but I can't. And I realized that, you know, I needed to figure out some reason. So I went, I had a doctor that had been with me for 21 years in Burbank, Dr. Ronald Schott, great guy. I don't know if he's still practicing, but all through my like mid twenties into my forties, this guy, you know, he, he was like the, like the, the, the quintessential family doctor. He, I came into his office one day and I just couldn't shake this cold. I had this like infectious thing going on and, and, and he was like watching me. And I guess, when I would go to cough, I would move my right hand up to cover my mouth, but I would cough here and then I'd go. So it was like a delayed reaction. I was coughing, thinking my hand was moving up, but my hand was moving very slow. And he said, I noticed that your face is, is less animated. He said, you know, you are always a, the joker, the comedian kind of guy, the goofball. And he said, I don't see any of that in your face. I mean, you're smiling, but I don't really see anything like that looks like the, you. And I said, all right, well, what are you telling me? And he goes, well, I think you need to go check to see if you have Parkinson's. And I was like, Parkinson's? Two years later, I went to UCLA and I got diagnosed. And it was like I said, almost on my birthday. And I came home and I'm sure my face was much more stayed than it is now. And my wife said, what would they say? And I said, well, I've got Parkinson's. And there was a pause and she said, so this is the, this is, this is the me ruining the day. This is it. Uh, I had completely forgotten about it because you know, you're mad, you're, 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 you're angry at something you're angry. At, it's displaced anger, whatever you want to call it. But I had forgotten that I ever said that and she didn't. And so it was really like an eye opener. And that started the journey as to, you know, my, my life as it is today now, 10, almost 11 years living with Parkinson's. Can you share a little bit about your career and perhaps why that specific career track uh, led you to deciding to hold your diagnosis with you and your family? I came down here to be an actor and was doing a play in Hollywood for a series of months, but wasn't really making any money at it and wasn't getting a commercial acting manager or, or you know, a, a, an agent. And so what ended up happening is I fell into what I studied in school, which was production and started on the Adams Family, the first one, and then went to Jurassic Park. I did Schindler's List, and so was Casper Congo. And at the end of Congo, I was a production coordinator and I had been in the film industry for, I don't know, what would that be, like six years or something. And I loved every minute of it. I just loved it. And it, and it, and it as I got into it, more and more opportunities came about. I went from being a production assistant to a production coordinator. Then I went to work for a visual effects company for a while, which was interesting, but not, not fast enough, not production-y enough. And then I got this perfect job being a content producer for doing behind the scenes documentaries of how movies are made. You know, it's, it's been a blessing, but what happens is, in, in my interpretation, is as you grow, it's hard to not to become captive to the money. And when you start to make a really good living, you start to want to make sure that nothing disrupts that. 
and Parkinson's would probably disrupt it. Early on, when I was diagnosed in 2012, I said to my doctor, I guess I should join uh, like a Parkinson's young onset group. And he goes, oh, no, no, no. And I said, why? And he goes, because you look totally normal. And in fact, that people say to me, with the exception of this writhing, that oh, I wouldn't even know. And I'm like, well, you know, there's a saying, if you met one person with Parkinson's, you met one person with Parkinson's. And so what kind of transpired is he talked me out of going to a young onset Parkinson's group. He didn't even want me to tell my kids. He's like, just tell your wife. So you got 10 good years before you have to really start worrying or making changes. But that meant that I was not the person that I could be because I'm usually open and talking about stuff. So I said, look, I don't know if I can do that. I mean, I've got a boss that I really appreciate and coworkers that are great. I, I need to let them know if anything. So if something were to happen to me, they'd, they'd understand that this thing might be going on or whatever. And so there became the battle for the first four years of do I tell everybody? Do I tell anybody? And my wife and I were kind of like struggling through, like she didn't know what it was going to mean for her. And she had just had cancer like two years before that. And my first reaction was I'm going to lose my wife. And it became all about me and nothing about her. And, and so here we were doing these role reversals. And I realized that, well, I better just shut it down for now and just try to keep doing whatever I'm doing. And I think because of all these fears that I had, I was letting my business slip away from me. Like I, I was not, it was not the same edge to it. It's not the same quality to it. It was being watered down. It was like, well, just get it in, get the next one in so we can get, get money for it. And that actually it blew up in my face, you know, much later on. Why did you decide to not share your diagnosis publicly? Why, why did you keep this from your colleagues and, you know, held this secret to yourself, as you said, um, wasn't you naturally. So, so what, what was your why? Why did you hold on to this diagnosis so privately? And I just was, was afraid that if my appearance changed or my, my ability to, to not gyrate while I'm talking to them, I just, I was, it was, it was as much vanity as it was fear of something that really honestly probably would never have said anything. I mean, if anything, people want to reach out and take care of you, but I didn't know that I was under the fear of don't lose your job. Don't, you know, do whatever it takes. I mean, you know, just, I honestly think that my fear was that somebody would go, Hey, you know, he's, he's compromised. He's, we don't know. So that was, and by the way, that was created all in my head. Never once did anybody ever say that, never once. But the fear and anxiety that I had going back to, you know, when I was a young child, if not even further back, was something that, you know, Parkinson's latched on to. Yeah, my, I really appreciate the way that you share so authentically and so honestly in the light of fear and in conversations we've had before you shared this this fear of being seen as the person with disability not being able to sit in confidence and in stillness with these interviews with celebrities also fear of changing your identity was shifting right you were becoming and potentially accepting a diagnosis of parkinson's which ultimately is a shift in the stories that we're living, right? The chapter of our story that we're choosing to live. And that fear of chain, of change, you know, is you had to admit that change was coming and it sounded like you weren't ready um, to admit that yet. I just wish people felt more confident in the way they may or may not perceive, perceive their body or their speech or their, you know, dyskinesia or dystonia or, tremors or whatever it may be, because I think it's one of those diseases where people just kind of want to sift into the ether and, and, and stay on the couch and hide in the shadows. And I'll tell you from the great, cause I was that guy for four years. I was literally like come home and I just zone out and, and veg out and go to sleep and fall asleep at four o'clock in the afternoon to wake up at four o'clock in the morning and be on the computer working and, um, and no time with my family. And I realized that, um, all those things are things that we perceive before we get into the environment. I don't know anybody that's ever come to me and said to somebody, you got to go because you're disrupting this people over at table four because you won't stop moving. I mean, I just think that people really want you to be a part of the community. And I think we, we, we have to stay strong as individuals and we have to rely on each other 
and there's great websites out there many of them are on facebook where people talk about you know life with parkinson's and people tell their stories or they're seeking advice or you know or they're they're talking about the medication they're new to the medication what can they expect all those things are important all those things about just you know i mean and and the fact is is that 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 core group of friends that hopefully we all have i know as we get older there's not as many of them but that core group of friends that you can call when you need to call somebody or that would be willing to come and get you and take you out don't pass on those opportunities ever because one hour with somebody who is outside of the realm of, of thinking about parkinson's is like rejuvenation and i also say always keep checking all modalities of exercise and, and medication and therapies and meditation and try them all and see what works for you and find the ones that, that matter because it's you and I, and I'm talking to the folks at home that are the ones living with this disease and doctors and everybody will offer incredible expert advice. I'm not putting anybody down in this, in this statement. I'm just saying that we live it. So why not make it the best we can make it day to day? Because that's really kind of what we got. I mean, you know, like I said, I have good days and I have better days because if I say I have bad days, which is, I know what's really being going on. Then I just go on the negative train th that direction. And I want to try to keep fighting this direction where I look at it. Hey, I got through the day. I, I had a great time. I had I got to see a buddy of mine I haven't seen in five years. We went out for a beer or we went out for ice cream or we took a walk in the park. Me and my wife love to walk. That just a simple act of exercising and walking is amazing. And I, I just, I hope people will try what they can and what versus what they can't do, because I think that matters because you matter ultimately. Well, we are at the end of our scheduled time together, but we don't want to miss the opportunity to answer some of your questions. So we're going to stay on an extra few minutes. If you aren't able to stay here with us live, remember that we will share the full recording with all attendees a little bit later uh, in the week. I'm excited to dive in. Elva, I'd love to start with you. We sure. heard from some attendees that they're feeling like they don't know how to talk about Parkinson's with the people in their life. And I know this is something you experienced. If you could make just one recommendation for folks who are in that spot, what would it be? Just be ready. Be ready for questions. Be ready for different feelings from people. Um, if you're ready, you're going to find out that it's going to be okay. And they're going to help you more than you ever thought they could. Um, staying positive and staying alert and on top of things is the best thing to do. Thank you, Alva. Really. JM, you shared about how you felt like Parkinson's latched on to your anxiety. I love that language. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this question from an attendee. They shared, um, my anxiety gets triggered by mundane things and I've got depressive feelings. What's one way that you keep yourself sort of grounded in the positive when things are feeling particularly heavy? Well, I, I've been told by two doctors at two different hospitals in the, in the 10 years that I've been living with this disease that the anxiety that I carry in my body is doing more damage than the anxiety than, than Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. Parkinson's is looking at it like there's more gasoline for the fire. Give it to us and we'll let it roll. But I mean, I can come in here. I can be sitting here watching this performance and be totally still because I'm not on camera. And I, I, I live the life of being on camera. So I don't know what the problem is. But then all of a sudden, you know, you click to me and I'm this, you know, because that's not Parkinson's. That's anxiety, in, in, in my opinion anxiety ratcheting it up and then you get depression i think is something that you know you just have to basically try to find the positive in in any and everything that you're doing is even if it's just one thing a day like hey i made my bed today that's mm -hmm. an achievement that's just moving forward mm -hmm. and you know um i there's just so many ways to do it but my wife you know after i had talked to everybody and let them know that this was this was going down and again to, there was great points from Elva, great points from Anna or Anna. I think I'm saying that right. Yeah, that's fine. But um, 
the idea that if your circle of friends is this big and you tell everybody that you have it and it gets to this big, this is so tight. This is so strong that you're protected in here. These people want to do stuff for you. I have guys that come around, guys, for a guy sitting in the, in the passenger seat who can easily get out of the car, open the door for me. They're like, you need some help. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, I'm okay. But, you know, thanks for looking out for me because they're thinking, how can they be a part of this in your life and how can they help you out? And a lot of times, like I said, you just, that phone call, I've got buddies that, from high school that call me once a week. How mm -hmm. you doing? Make sure you're okay. Because I do get depressed and I do get down and I do sometimes go, what, you know, blank, blank, blank. But in reality is my wife introduced me to the word at, at probably like 48, 49 years old of gratitude. Mm -hmm. And a little practice is if you wake up every day mm -hmm. and find five things that you're gra grateful for and list them off. And the next day, try to add one. And then the next day, try to add one. And then maybe you have a day where you just, you, you don't feel grateful for anything. But then the phone rings and you're like, oh, I'm grateful for the fact that my friend Bob called me or my friend Janice called me. Those are the simple things that you can do for yourself that medicine can't do and therapy can't do. And it's just like, like self-meditation, self, self-awareness is really helpful. And you just have to find the thing that works for you. I box for, until the pandemic, I box three times a week at a Parkinson's boxing thing. Amazing. So that's, that's, I hope I answered the question. Yeah. Yeah. I think you did. I think finding support, finding things to be grateful for and, and really doing your best to find even just that one positive thing um, to keep things somewhat positive in your life. I think that's I'm wonderful. Question. I'm grateful that you're here and I'm grateful that I'm here because I get to talk to you and you can ask me a question. And I feel like I help somebody, I hope. Yeah. Now, all of us are here because we want to help people. That's it. You know, yeah. um, and this is, and I'm, I'm going to jump, I'm going to throw this out there and let other people tee off on it, but community is important. And I think the community, Parkinson's community, like the Young Onset Network, I think that, uh, is it Anna that has that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those things are key. I mean, they're unbelievably important because when I would walk into the boxing class, I would cross the threshold and now everybody on the mat mm -hmm. was, had Parkinson's. And so we were normal. Those people sitting on the, uh, along the, be the benches that are not in the boxing class, are most of our caregivers, they're, they're not in the club. It's an exclusive <laughs> club. Nobody wants to join, but it's an exclusive club. So we got to make the best yeah. of it. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I'll, I'll pivot now over to Anna. Um, I know you spent quite a few years working with Parkinson's and we've gotten questions from attendees about uh, yeah. rights and safeguards in place for people who are working and have been diagnosed with Parkinson's. I know this is something you talk about within the Young Onset Parkinson's Network. Can you just share one little piece about how uh, the Young Onset Parkinson's Network can support folks as they figure out what uh, right. supports may be available for them. Yeah, sure, I'd love to, thanks. Um, you know, I guess what we can provide is, is, is a larger form of what we, what, we, what we have here today in a way, right? Um, we have, you know, close to a thousand members now. We've all been in various stages of the disease. Um, anyone who was diagnosed under the age of 55 or under can join for free. And we are international at this point. So uh, when we come together as a group, um, we have a whole, we, we meet as a group twice a month, once as a speaker or education uh, um, presentation. But the next one is a community gathering where we have a no, no agenda meeting. Everyone comes on, we break out into small Zoom rooms and chat. And uh, we talk about experiences. We talk about, you know, that the whole telling your work is very, just like everything with Parkinson's, it's very, very personal and it can be very different. And, and the timing, the right timing is your timing, right? It's not necessarily my timing. And the type of business you work for, you might be in a small family business, like I was in a big fortune 500, you know? So it, it, all, it all matters in, in making your choice. And, uh, you know, the ADA is there, like, you know, I said in my, in my video, but um, hearing from people's experiences, both good and bad will help you make that decision. Um, and then that what's next in the whole disability process is a whole other thing, especially if you're young, young, getting it young, right? You're, you're probably working and you're dealing with disability. So we have a whole lot of resources that we have available around that too. That helps. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anna. Sure. Um, Kelly, 
We got a really great question from an attendee on Facebook Live that I'd love for you to touch on. They asked how to approach discussing Parkinson's disease with family members when the person with Parkinson's hasn't disclosed their condition. However, they may pose some sort of a risk, like you know, if they're still driving or they're caring for grandchildren, how do you balance these two really important needs of honoring your loved one with Parkinson's and protecting your loved ones who have a right to know what they need to know to be safe? Yeah, that's a difficult um, topic. And as I mentioned, when I started, it's um, everybody's, you know, family circumstances are so different. Um, having those hard conversations um, are really important, um, really pointedly sitting down and trying to be as transparent and say, hey, we have to talk about something difficult here. Um, and, and putting on the table the difficult topics. Um, I think always prepping conversations that are hard with saying, hey, we need to address something hard. When do you want to do that? You know, making sure people are mentally and actually prepared for the conversation. So it's not being sprung upon them um, at the wrong time, you know, if you're not ready to take it in. Um, so that intentional discussion um, is really important um, so that open, honest um, concerns can be addressed. And those difficult topics like driving or safety concerns, you know, we have to bring those forward. Um, to the medical team where we might need some guidance and, and extra support. But we always um, encourage on the medical side, you know, trying as much as you can to transparently talk and, and say we have to have those difficult conversations at home. If there are real barriers to that and they just can't take place for some reason at home, you know, making sure um, family members who are involved in care know they can reach out to their medical team and say, hey, doctor, hey, nurse, I need to talk to you about something that we're seeing that's a concern because you can surround yourself with other support as well in trying to address something like that. So I hope that helps. I was just going to add that, um, you know, I think we as people with Parkinson's can play a big role in that too, right? So mm -hmm. we need to be realistic of what we can and can't do. And quite frankly, there might be a situation where the family thinks you can't do things sooner than you can't, right? So, I mean, you know, there's that issue as well, but we need to be realistic of our abilities and the safety of everyone. And much like my 91-year-old mom that I take care of, you know, periodically, I mean, she she gave me the car. She she told me it was time to sell her car. She told me that she was going to get a scooter. She told me, like, she told me she was going to move into a, a, a community care place. So she's very, very prideful on not having to have her kids tell her what to do. So, you know, I think that you can, you can take that approach too and make, you make, you be in control of your life and you, you make the decisions at, but as long as you're doing it in a realistic, safe way. Yeah. If I may add that um, if you live in Los Angeles, not having to drive is a beautiful it's a thing. Perk. <laughs> because of the 300,000 hours I've spent driving from the Valley to the, to Santa Monica, four or five freeway ate up most of them sitting still. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I mean, you, and you touched on it, Anna, which is can and can't do. And so if you can no longer do it, don't focus on the fact that you can't just go forward with what you can do mm -hmm. and just dropping baggage as you go, because it's all it becomes is that you sit and I'm no longer independent. Well, there's a lot of things you can do to be independent and walking is a good one, but you know, I mean, Uber and all those kinds of things are out there for people. Yeah. And, and it's just, a lot of, go ahead. A lot of, we, we have a lot more options than those before us did, sure. Agreed, well, agreed. Even when I was 46, I mean, it was very different than mm -hmm. it is today. Yeah. Yeah, all really great points. Well, I appreciate all of your insights. I'm so, so very grateful to our amazing presenters. Thank you on behalf of the Parkinson's Foundation. And thank you to all of us who joined today. As a reminder, um, a follow-up email will be sent out with a survey. We'd love to hear what you thought about today's program. Um, for those of you who are with us now, who are the loved one of someone with Parkinson's, we'd love for you to join us again in on November 15th when we talk about uh, 
keeping their secret, the, the family perspective of this Parkinson's Anonymous. And uh, we also want to just remind you to look out for the link to today's presentation and additional resources that will be coming um, within the next week or so. So thank you again. And uh, we wish you the very best as you navigate this Parkinson's journey. We are here for you and with you. And uh, we are so excited to support your needs. Feel free to reach out to our Parkinson's Foundation helpline by calling 1-800-4PD-INFO, or you can email us at helpline at parkinson.org. We hope to see you again soon.